to Brussels after calling out NATO nations for not paying the fair share towards defense of the entire NATO group. President Trump is now suggesting that countries not only meet the commitment of 2% GDP, which they're supposed to meet by 2024, but increase that to 4% of GDP on defense spending. Plus, it is a multi-pronged economic attack coming from President Trump, beating up on these major global players on your screen, criticizing German Chancellor Angela Merkel and Germany for being a, quote, captive of Russia's energy supplies because Germany uh, imports a lot of Russian national ga natural gas. And this is just days ahead of President Trump's meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Overnight, the U.S. unveiled an additional 10 percent tariff on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports. How will the president's actions continue to play out on the global stage? And what impact is this going to have not only on our relations with allies, but on our U.S. economy? We want to bring in former U.S. ambassador for special political affairs at the U.N., Stuart Holliday, and former W. WTO deputy director and former U.S. ambassador to the GATT, which had been the precursor to WTO, Ambassador Rufus Yerksa. Uh, ambassador Holliday, I'll begin with you. Let's be clear, only five NATO members anyway have reached, including the U.S., that 2 percent goal. He's calling for 4 percent. Um, is that feasible at this point? I think it's going to be a challenge. I think the first step is to get the 2 percent, which all the allies committed to uh, in the wake of the invasion of Crimea in 2014 in Wales. They pledged 2 percent. There have been a few more countries moving that way. I think that would be a good start. Uh, I think that, uh, as a bargaining chip, the 4 percent is an interesting device, but it'd be very difficult. These are national uh, decisions by parliaments and legislatures to get a 4 percent across the board. Well, that's an important point, I think, because everybody thinks this is an Angela Merkel decision. But like democracies work, you got to have that parliament or Congress, no matter what, uh, weigh in on this. Uh, but Germany um, isn't even one of, Stuart, the five. I mean, Greece is meeting the 2 percent and Germany, the wealthiest nation in the European Union as a NATO member, is not. Um, this, this part I get. Yeah, and I think Germany, of course, is, uh, could do more, uh, as the president said. But you have to remember, Germany is probably also contributing a net gross amount that's pretty significant, even though the percentage, because their GDP is much larger than that of Greece. Um, so the question is, what's the right amount to protect mm -hmm. our allies? But we have to remember there's also uh, an arrangement to protect the United States security. There are boots on the ground, NATO boots on the ground in Afghanistan. It's all about us as an alliance. It's not just about the U.S. versus Europe. Ambassador Yerksa, um, the president also went after Germany for importing as the largest uh, importer of Russian natural gas in the U European Union. He, he said that, uh, you know, here we're supposed to be protecting as, as an alliance against uh, Russian aggression, and yet you, you've got this deal. Let's play a little bit of what happened this morning when he brought this up, and then I'll have you comment. A whole different story. I think energy is a much different story than normal trade. Okay, is it a different story than, quote, normal trade when it comes to energy? Well, I think, you know, it's obviously energy trade between uh, Europe and Russia is, is, I don't think, that's not our main trade concern. We're obviously concerned about Europe's reliance on, on Russia, uh, but, you know, unlike the U.S., Europe is energy, more energy dependent than we are. They got to get it from somewhere. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, the broader question uh, is whether, you know, Europe is still strongly aligned with the U.S. Uh, in NATO, uh, which Stewart's talked about. I don't really think that the energy issue is the major trade issue the administration is, has got to deal with at this time. Mm -hmm. and, and Ambassador, uh, I hope you can hear me. I guess by yes. that logic, uh, the president had said that, that Germany is captive because they import Russian natural gas. Uh, we actually import oil from Venezuela, a little bit, half a million barrels per day. We also import from Saudi Arabia, but I, I wouldn't say that we're captive or totally owned. Those were the president's words to Venezuela or Saudi Arabia, hardly. So um, does, the, does this really ring as a, as a logistical um, logic when it comes to this thought? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure why the president was raising this point against the Europeans. It seems to me he's, he, he's been sort of looking for ways of, of taking the Europeans on when we should be working harder to strengthen our alliance with them because the real trade problems we face 
correctly cited by the administration are problems with China's China. behavior, and we need allies, we need greater support, instead of sort of getting into these uh, uh, fights with Europeans and, and our other allies over okay. products like steel and, and uh, autos, we should be focusing on how to address the, the China challenge. Ambassador Holliday, uh, the question becomes that point. Are we stronger together against China or stronger apart? The, the conventional wisdom would be that we're stronger together, and yet China has continued to batter our intellectual property, and uh, now mm -hmm. we have the $200 billion in tariffs. So uh, does it send a message, or, or do you anticipate that uh, we might see some type of a bending on behalf of China? Well, I think we are stronger to, together. Um, I do not think that having uh, somebody else like China write the rules of the, you know, the trade regime for the world uh, are in our interest. That said, you're right, uh, they haven't been effective. I don't know that this will uh, change China's behavior in the short term because it's all about saving face and being strong in terms of not giving anything. I, th I think they'll reciprocate up to a point. But I think they've gotten the message, uh, at least especially on technology and intellectual property, that we're not going to stand for it mm -hmm. uh, anymore. There needs to be a, a red line drawn. But we're going to need to work with our partners on this. Maybe not directly pressuring okay. China, but working together to create a uh, better trade framework. Uh, before we go, Ambassador York, so we'll also have to maybe work with our own Congress. Uh, Jeff Flake, uh, the senator, had, had mentioned last night, I think during, during our show, he said, you know what, we're going to put something forth because a lot of these senators are very upset about the tariffs. They hurt local businesses. Today already, uh, the Senate passed a non-binding measure that gives Congress a role in imposing national security tariffs. Um, because they don't like this. Uh, does this mean that we're going to have a standoff between Congress and, of course, the president? Well, I think that's certainly starting to happen. I think there's major concerns in the Congress about these national security actions on steel, aluminum, the threat of actions on automobiles, which is 10 times the size of, of the steel and aluminum industries uh, and would really widen trade wars with our major allies. Mm -hmm. And I think what they're really saying is we ought to be working with those countries, negotiating with them. Uh, th we do need their support in pressuring China, as Stuart says, okay. to, to behave better by the rules. And I don't think that in the long run, loading costs on U.S. industry and consumers and precipitously raising tariffs is, is a good strategy.